PCOS, which was earlier known as PCOD, a lot of people think it's two different things. They're honestly the same thing. It was called polycystic ovarian disease, but it's not a disease or a disorder. So now it's called polycystic ovarian syndrome. It's honestly so much more common than you'd believe. Uh, a lot of studies say between 5 to 8% of women in the reproductive age group have PCOS. But there are studies showing even up to 20% of women, which is like one in five women today, have PCOS. So it's extremely common. Sometimes it may be latent and you may not have full-blown symptoms. But once you go through a period of inactivity, you know, your lifestyle becomes a little sedentary, it starts becoming apparent. But if you have that tendency, you will have a whole host of symptoms that happen because of PCOS. Uh, you know, it sounds like it's very ordinary. Oh, of course, it's so common, so many people have it. But it can have pretty serious implications in the sense of how it affects your lifestyle, how it affects your self-confidence. So as a dermatologist, uh, by the way, I am Dr. Tanvi Vaidya. I'm a consultant dermatologist, medical director of Derma MD Clinics. Today, I'm going to be talking about how PCOS can affect your skin and your hair and the importance of it, how you can deal with it and all of that. So let's dive right in. Firstly, how do you suspect if you have PCOS? You may have PCOS if you have any of these symptoms. One is, let's start from top to bottom, if you have a thinning of hair on your scalp, typically in the frontal hairline, it starts thinning out, it starts widening, that could be a sign. Second is increase in facial hair growth, abdominal hair growth or chest hair growth. These are all hormonally dependent areas. So if you feel like there's an increase in hair growth in these areas, that could be a sign of PCOS. Next comes acne. So if you have a lot of acne typically around the jawline, that could again indicate a little bit of PCOS. Next comes weight gain. Now a lot of people assume that if you have PCOS, you have to have weight gain. It doesn't mean that you necessarily have weight gain. I've seen so many absolutely very, very slim, very, very lean uh, girls who have a very, very low BMI who also have PCOS. So this isn't a mandate, but it's one of the symptoms which could indicate. Next comes, of course, irregular menstrual cycles. Now, usually most people with PCOS have periods coming in very late. So a normal 28-day to 30-day cycle would turn into a 40-day cycle or a 45-day cycle. Some people don't even get their periods without medication. So it's just like, you know, dragging on and on. However, there can be people who get their periods very early. Uh, their cycles may be like a 20-day cycle or a 15-day cycle, which could also be an indicator of PCOS. In PCOS, literally what is happening is, internally, there are multiple cysts in your ovaries rather than just one cyst which is rupturing at the time of ovulation, which is why polycystic ovarian disease. So if you do an ultrasound, you may see multiple cysts. Will you always see multiple cysts? No. You may not always see multiple cysts either. So it's not just the ultrasound which is going to diagnose you as PCOS. There are a bunch of criteria that you need to satisfy. If any of those criteria are being met, you could have a PCOS. US. Along with this, if you do your blood test, you may have hyperandrogenism, which is an increase in androgen levels like your testosterone, your DHEAS, your DHT, all of these could be raised. You may have insulin resistance. So there are certain tests which will check for insulin resistance because of which you get a lot of the manifestations of PCOS. Now, I don't want to get into the menstrual part of it because honestly, that's not my forte. I'm not a gynecologist. I'm a dermatologist. I want to talk to you about how it affects your skin and hair. Now, coming to most of these skin and hair manifestations are because of two things. One is the androgen excess and second is the insulin resistance and of course a combination of these two. So the androgen excess causes a female pattern thinning. So there are more receptors for androgens on our scalp in the hair follicles in this pattern. So in males, when they have an androgenetic thinning, they have a recession of the frontal hairline, they have a thinning at the vertex. In females, we get this a widening of the central partition as we call it. We also call it a Christmas tree pattern. This is how it was described in our textbooks where, you know, it literally widens in like a Christmas tree pattern. Now, when this happens, it is going to be a long-term issue. It is, even if your PCOS improves, sometimes this tends to persist. So most of the treatments that you would use for a female pattern hair loss would be long-term treatments. Don't expect to just apply a serum for six months and it's never going to happen again. This is a tendency that you have, so you're going to have to keep applying regular serums to work on it. I don't want to get into the specifics because most of the serums that we give for female pattern hair loss would be prescription-grade treatments. So definitely 
consult your dermatologist before starting anything but don't waste too much time with a female pattern thinning what happens is you know the regrowth is not going to just happen spontaneously at whatever time you start treatment only about 30 to 40 percent of that hair can be regrown even if you do high grade your minoxidils your prps you do exosomes all of that only a 30 to 40 percent is going to regrow so when that's the case you don't want to waste too much time on it get started on treating it early next coming to your hirsutism now when we're talking about hirsutism we're talking about excess facial hair typically thick hair that starts growing along your jawline on your chin your upper lip sometimes your upper neck sometimes it gets really uh, very problematic it becomes very very evident um the one thing i really like to say here is that don't let it affect your self-confidence i know there's more than enough people out there who will sit and make fun of you for facial hair but frankly you're more than your facial hair so don't don't let it affect you if you want to get rid of it i will tell you what you can do waxing and threading and epilating is not something i recommend doing for facial hair because it's very painful it's very traumatic it's also going to leave your skin pretty loose it's going to worsen your acne which you're already prone to because of your pcos um what you can consider doing is shaving definitely you can absolutely shave there's nothing wrong with shaving it does not make your hair grow thicker the only problem is you're going to have to keep doing it again and again laser hair reduction is something that you can consider for pcos related facial hair but the problem here is that with hormonally dependent hormonally stimulated hair that hormonal stimulation is going to keep stimulating that hair so normally without pcos if it were to take six to eight sittings with a pcos it would take more sittings than that if your pcos is very very active and the hormonal stimulation is really active your growth may keep coming back you may do 20 sessions and it may still keep coming back so in these situations you know i always counsel my patients before they start i always check for pcos before they start on a laser hair reduction and i always tell them that you may have to view this as a maintenance therapy you know if you keep shaving you have to shave practically every week or once in two weeks depending on you know how much growth is coming back if you're doing a laser hair reduction this may go down so you can do a laser sitting once in about three months or once in six months just to keep your growth thin and minimal so it's not very evident so you may have to view your laser like that it may not be a permanent removal it's just a reduction that you may have to keep maintaining so this is something you should really understand before going into laser hair reduction when you have pcos what about your other areas like your arms your legs these are not hormonally sensitive areas so they will respond in six to eight sittings the hair growth in those areas will go away it's just your face your neck your chest your abdomen these are the areas that i'm typically talking about next coming to acne now acne is one of the most common problem that people with pcos face you know a lot of people whose pcos is a little mild it's not so active um your acne is fine in covid for example when suddenly everyone's lifestyles became very sedentary a lot of people who didn't have any overt pcos suddenly became overt the cycle started coming late because of the sudden change in your lifestyle so acne at times like this will massively start flaring up um typically pcos or hormonally sensitive acne is usually along the jawline as we say of course it can happen elsewhere but along the jawline large cystic painful acne yes they very well can happen the most important thing with any of these pcos related symptoms is to work on your pcos itself so working on your diet your exercise any hormonal medication as per your gynex advice you may want to take to work on it because the acne is just a symptom at the end of the day how can you work on your acne see if it's mild you can try home remedies you can try otc products like a benzyl peroxide face wash you can use a salicylic acid serum you can use um azelaic acid niacinamide all of these ingredients work really well on controlling that acne you can use myo inositol based supplements which are not hormonal medication as such but they really help reduce that hormonal flare on your acne uh, all of these things will really help in controlling it however if you have cystic painful pustular acne then definitely consult a dermatologist you will probably need prescription grade treatments you will need retinoids whether it's oral or topical retinoids but you may need those you may need some oral antibiotics topical antibiotics um definitely don't start your treatment based on this video uh, you may also need hormonal medication anti androgenic medication which may really help you or uh, please remember that none of these things are lifelong so you know even if it sounds really scary that oh my god my dermat asked me to take so and so medicine it's uh, needed at that point 
I want you to treat your acne because I don't want your acne to go into a stage of scarring. So during that period when your acne is really cystic and severe, you may need medication and take that medication at that point if you're fit for it. If uh, your acne settles after that, don't stop everything. At least maintain with topical prescription grade retinoids to prevent that acne because darling, you have a condition that is predisposing you at a higher risk of acne. So that's not going away. Of course, work on your lifestyle. Despite doing all of that, if you still have that tendency, you will need some level of skincare to keep your acne in check. So please remember all of these things. The next thing that a lot of people with PCOS face is something called acanthosis nigricans. This is a kind of pigmentation which develops typically in your underarms, the back of your neck, sometimes on your face in areas like under your chin, sides of your cheek, sometimes on your forehead, sometimes even under your eyes. In this, your skin is not just pigmented, it also thickens a little bit. It develops this velvety kind of texture. So it's thickened and pigmented skin. When there is acanthosis nigricans, it is usually an indicator of an underlying insulin resistance. Means insulin ban rare, but your body is not receptive to it, which happens typically with PCOS, typically with uh, diabetes, pre-diabetes, or just metabolic syndrome, where there is weight gain. All of these conditions can cause an acanthosis. If you have an acanthosis, of course, with, as I keep saying, with all of these conditions, keep working on your metabolic status through lifestyle and diet changes. Definitely, that makes maximum difference. Along with that, you can use some depigmenting ingredients, some exfoliating ingredients like AHAs, retinoids, which can help to keep that acanthosis in check. For example, for your neck or your underarms, you can use any of these creams. I've linked a couple of recommendations here. You can use these creams to lighten that skin out. However, don't rely on only this, also your lifestyle changes. Next, coming to skin tags. Skin tags, again, extremely common in PCOS. You get these tiny skin colored or brownish or blackish little growths on your face. Not just your face, sometimes on your face, your eyelids, your neck, very common sight, underarms, sometimes under the breast. These are very, very common areas for skin tags to develop. Skin tags um, are purely cosmetic issues. You don't have to really, you don't have to have to treat them. They're never going to turn cancerous or anything like that. But if it bothers you cosmetically or it's annoying to you, it's in an area where, you know, the friction is getting annoying, it's getting painful, then we can cauterize them. What we do is no creams honestly work on skin tags. What we do is we apply a numbing cream. We keep it for 30 to 40 minutes. We just burn it off with this tip of a device called a radio cautery. Uh, it forms a little scab which falls off in four to five days and your skin is back to normal. It usually doesn't leave any mark unless there's a lot of sun exposure or unless you've played with the scab or unless it's a very large size skin tag. You know, sometimes in the underarms typically there are very large skin tags which end up leaving a little bit of a mark. But otherwise they don't even leave a mark. They don't bother. It's one of the simplest procedures to do and um, the most rewarding because it's a very dramatic difference. Lastly comes stretch marks. So stretch marks happen when you suddenly gain weight and lose weight. It's because of the stretching of the skin uh, because of which collagen fibers are getting sort of torn and stretch marks are developing. If it's happening in an early stage where the stretch marks are slightly reddish, you can use a retinoid based cream along with a moisturizer to prevent it from turning into those white long lasting stretch marks. However, if they're white, it probably won't respond so much to creams. However, do keep moisturizing it. If you want to really get rid of it, we can do micro needling with PRP. We can do MNRF to at least minimize the appearance a little bit. Unless your stretch marks are very problematic, very cosmetically evident and really bothering you, I personally don't recommend always working on stretch marks because frankly, everyone has them. I have them. Uh, models have them, uh, actors have them, actresses have them. Everything that we see, you know, is always a photoshopped image. So you're not seeing the stretch marks, but most people do have stretch marks. So unless it's really evident, you know, in some people, they're very, very evident right on their arms in areas where it's very visible and then it gets embarrassing. In those cases, of course, we do remove them. One thing I'd really like to say at the end of this video is that PCOS is a metabolic issue. 90% of cases improve through just diet and exercise. When I'm talking about diet, I'm talking about minimizing sugar in your diet. When I talk about sugar, I'm talking about anything that's going to get your blood glucose level up. So sugar, honey, jaggery, even high glycemic index products like corn, maida, anything that's going to get your blood sugar level to go up fast has to be avoided. 
Second thing to avoid is dairy. Now dairy contains something called IGF-1 which is insulin like growth factor 1 which the same way as insulin resistance is going to worsen your insulin resistance further. So yes, if you have PCOS, avoid these two things in your diet majorly. Have a lot of fiber, a lot of protein, a lot of water, uh, a lot of antioxidants as well. Dry fruits, nuts, seeds, all of that really, really help with PCOS along with that exercise. So a little bit of cardio, a little bit of strength training goes a long way in dealing with PCOS. And I have seen so, so many patients improve in PCOS with just lifestyle changes no medication okay however now coming to this if you need medication you need medication uh, you know there are people despite doing everything they'll go vegan they'll exercise every day they'll do everything in their power but still the hormonal changes are so strong that you need medication and if you need medication you need medication there's nothing wrong about it the side effects of having uncontrolled insulin resistance or uncontrolled PCOS are so much that you'd rather have the minimal side effects of those medications okay your doctor will always explain to you the pros and cons of taking medication if your cycles are very skewed you may need hormonal medication whether it's oc pills anti-androgens you may need those at those periods it does not need to be lifelong it's only for the period that you need it okay gradually your insulin resistance starts to improve so please have faith in your gynac have faith in your dermat they are here to help you through this journey uh, a lot of people going through PCOS also face a lot of mental health struggles sometimes because of all of these physical struggles. So if you feel you need help, you need to talk to anyone, do talk to a friend, to a therapist, to your doctor and I'm sure you'll be able to push through this and see the other side and realize that PCOS is just a part of your life. It's not controlling your life. It's not ruining your life in any way. It's just a small part of your life that you just have to learn how to live with and how to navigate. If you have any more questions, please ask me in the comments and I'll be happy to help.